Let go. My family, I love you. Just know I do it for you. Keep doing it for me. Keep doing it for your boy. Fair use and they caboose bone. I love to my man, your man, Isaac, man. I call him the music man. Isaac's man, he's, he's taking over, man. Just supervising our music, man. Music supervisor, rocket man. You know what I'm saying? Making the show. We got the drop, man, on the uh, most classic albums, man. So we just got some more goodies, man. You know what I'm saying? Always in the crate. So this is going to be an ongoing thing. An ongoing thing. It's just getting started. Um, you know, we're taking over the grid with this frequency. We're, we're getting harmonic. You know what I'm saying? We're giving people options. You know, if you're going to. If you're going to listen to your music, you should at least be conscious of the frequency it's in. I mean, we've come too far now just to not question the frequency of things, such as our language, such as our music. So let's, uh, you know, just start being aware again. All we do at 432 is promote vibration awareness, whether that's through the music, whether that's through the information, the books, the drop. Whether that's through our land, our refuge, vibration awareness for the people, for the creator, Hawa. This is at R. Carlos Nakai Canyon Trilogy 432. I mean, you know what I'm saying? How convenient, you know, because we're in that part. What's this part? Five. Of the Indians and Israelites. I'm going back to back with this because I wanted to tie some more things together. Again, this is going to really mirror the, uh, you know, go hand in hand to a nice little samba, a nice little tango with the uh, Forbidden Histories of America, Kalelus, because we're going to be in the same document, just kind of going, you know, you just connecting more dots. All the series are, are connected, whether it's the Chronicle of Akakor, you know what I'm saying, Forbidden Histories. Indians and Israelites, whether we're reading the Book of Enoch or getting the flat connected universe, you know what I'm saying? Um, this is a connected thing, whether we're in the frequency of our creator, the timelines, uh, you know what I'm saying, true chronology, all of this is playing. Whether we're in Preston John, it's all playing. It's all playing. It's all lining up, man. So you got the link. This is another uh, wonderful flute suite, man, you know. Um, the brother just hit me, <laughs> hit me and said, man, I got another flute suite, man. So you have options, man. And remember, remember, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the library's back for your pleasure. So again, you have this uh, flute suite here. We're going to leave this link to give you this flute suite here. This is the uh, the trilogy album, man. Uh, Dawn's Mirage, Ancestral Home. That's the name of this song playing. This is for educational purposes, you know what I mean? Just so we can hear it in 432. Do the research. Do the reporting and do the teaching and the scholarship and the research on the frequency of the music. And uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go, man. So you got all the, all the drop in the library. And, you know, just a great free resource for the community, man. And um, many more, many more. You also have the free resource, man, just by signing up to Drop VIP. You got the link below, man. We tune five songs a month for free. If you're signed up and you ain't got your link, just, you know, email us. Music at 432thedrop.com. Shoot your link. It's all good. Nice and easy, man. All you need is your link. If you uh, are still interested in getting uh, any shirts or whatever while the site is down, you know what I'm saying, you can get the packages, but the shirts... Just, you know, send me a link, send me an email, music at 432 to drop. We're actually setting up an eBay store so you can do it real quick from the, you know, eBay location. You ain't got a trip, man. You ain't got a trip. And those no hijacks and loud shirts, man. I'm going to do a drop showing how I get down with them, man. Just wanted to keep doing some beta testing, you know, washing them, make sure it makes sense. You know what I mean? So, you know, hey, I just want to perfect things for y'all. But I also got some giveaways coming up, man, just to get them, you know, get that frequency moving man so a lot coming up for the family a lot to be excited about man and uh this is our new year happy new year my people yeah man this feels like a new year 
I mean, shoot, either people starting this year choosing up or they just getting wiped out. They just getting washed up and washed out. And you feel it and you notice it and you see it, man, because those that are choosing up, man, they're just excited and energetic. They feel good. They know they're talking about their promised land. They're in redemption mode. They feel they feel redeemed. You know, it's just an energy that you feel. And others are sitting at you. Ah, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like that you guys are reading books. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, that's just real spill, man. Some people are choosing down in this new year, man. <laughs> so, dodge the hijack, man. Stay above the firmament. What my brother Hiram say, nine above the firmament. And speaking of my brother Hiram, man, as promised, we're going to get this brother, man, kicking uh, nothing but that real, real. Go ahead and uh, dig on with his kicking, man. Family surname of racial hit list. It is so cold and so true. Go dig on the brother Hiram Mark. Ancient artifacts found in the Grand Canyon. And he got a part two to this that he just dropped. So, you know, go, go dig on all that. We'll be, uh, you know, doing a belly flop into the Grand Canyon. You know what I mean? Just flowing with this lesson here. And uh, let's get back in that forbidden history. We're going to do a lot of good reading, man. So fall back. I got my alkaline. Hope y'all digging on it, man. And, uh, man, it's just good. You know, I'm just always happy to be surrounded by your energy, man. You know what I mean? It really is a pure thing, a pure water. It just makes sense. This is what we do. And we're going to keep building for you. The Most High has big plans for you. The Most High has big plans for you, people. My people. The Most High has big plans for all of us. Don't get, you know, don't get hijacked, man. By no negative energy, no chaos. Do what you do. You know, do what you got to do. Get through it, man. I depend on you to get through it because I depend on your energy. I know you're depending on me to dodge the hijack for sure, for sure, for sure. And that's what it is, man. Let the creator rock. Let the creator reign forever. Yeah, you, you know, I got enough for you to read. Because sometimes you just got to see things for yourself. So we're talking about pomegranates in the city of Montezuma, you know. What else is there to talk about but, but, but pomegranates <laughs> in the city of Montezuma? What else is there to talk about but a pomegranate or two or three? If you ain't talking about pomegranates tonight, today, you missing out, man. Let's go. The pomegranate was used as an icon and believed to be the metaphorical fruit in which Eve partook leading to the mortality of Adam and Eve. Ah, some people say that she partook of the apple, but did she partake of the pomegranate? <laughs> All right, a metaphorical fruit in which Eve partook leading to the mortality of Adam and Eve. Some even believe it was the literal fruit, and this they are mistaken. <clears throat> Moses sent scouts to the promised land for reasons unknown. Perhaps his curiosity was just too much, knowing the Israelites would not go there, at least in his time. However, the scouts brought back pomegranate, sources say, to demonstrate the fertility of the promised land. I say ridiculous, they brought back Moses pomegranate as evidence to, they brought back Moses pomegranate as evidence to demonstrate that they had found the place of the Garden of Eden and the Promised Land. Moses knew the Garden of Eden was in the Promised Land and the pomegranate was growing there. Today, it is believed pomegranate originated in Iran, Iran. I hardly think you could get a sage brush to grow in Iran. However, in the time of Moses, Iran was a lush tropical zone 
being situated smack dab in the middle of the equator of BC times, uh, whatever times that is, its environment would have been very similar to that of Brazil or Africa's Congo. I'm not saying that pomegranate could not have grown there, but I am saying look at where pomegranate grows today in the environment it grows naturally. The Garden of Eden was not a tropic, tropical zone. However, it was a perfect environment where anything could have grown. The book of Exodus describes Me'il, Me'il, robe of the ephod, worn by the Hebrew high priest as having pomegranates embroidered, embroidered on the hem. According to the book of Kings, the capitals of the two pillars, Jachan, Jachin, and Boaz, that stood in front of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem were engraved with pomegranates. It is said that Solomon designed his coronet based on the pomegranate's crown, Calix. All right, like I said, we're merging these series right now, man, doing a nice little samba samba with the Forbidden Histories of America series and uh, this Indians and Israelites because we want to look at it from, you know, a couple perspectives with the term, the term, the term Indian. You know, talking about, okay, the indigenous copper colored people of America and the Indian of India and the connection between the Indian of India and the copper color race here in America, which seems to be the same when we talk about the indigenous drop of the indigenous of India. Nothing today is what it seems, man. From land to land, you know, the people there are not the original people. You got to dig to find the original people. And you keep finding yourself. And you keep finding pomegranates. It is said that Solomon designed his coronet based on the pomegranate's crown, Calix. Calix, all right. Why would the pomegranate be important in the case of the Lady Medallion? It would seem that in some examples of the use of the pomegranate, it appears at times it was used in the place of the lotus and at times combined. So again, the brother Hiram Art that we're about to get, he's dropping on some lotus drop. He's been, you know, covering that well. And, um, you know, what's the indigenous, you know, truth of this uh, lotus and, you know, what it symbolizes as far as the rebirth and, and whatnot. So... The lotus carries the meaning of purity or wisdom. All right. And the pomegranate, a representation of fertility or being fruitful. On the lady of elk or elche, bust. And the medallion we see hanging around her neck is what appears to be on the bottom row of the necklace, the lotus petal. But the second row above, it appears to be something different, and that is the pomegranate calyx. On the bus, rendition seeds are also shown, also show on what would be the petal of the calyx, the crown. Ah, this calyx is getting clear. All right. So these are the lotus. You know, hanging from lady, the lady's head coming from the area of the ears or from behind the wheel of Dharma like tassels are found the pomegranate bud just before it flowers. So it's the pomegranate bud just before it flowers. In the following image, we get a better idea of comparison. Okay. All right, pomegranate buds. Okay. Here we go. Tasso representation of pomegranate buds. Alright, you got the link, man. Dig on it. So these are this is an ivory artifact representation of pomegranate buds. 
Song of Solomon 4.3, thy lips are like the thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely, which is beautiful. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks, thy locks, <laughs> thy locks, what are we talking about? Hair locks, you know, some people say dread locks, but you know. Locks, man. Locks. Thy locks. <laughs> Thy lips. Uh, this is very descriptive. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. And thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Song of Solomon 6, 7. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. Now in my book, The Treasure of Utah, man, we got to get this, man. Anybody get a PDF on this, Treasure of Utah? This was his previous book, The Treasure of Utah. You already know I got the drop, so let's go. I spoke of the Roman Jewish colonies, or Roma, Romani, Israelite colonies. But we're getting it. I mean, you know, we're getting it, you know. We're just uh, suffering, suffering, connecting these things. And the maps that the Spanish use, who likely create the maps, being some of them are 14th and 15th century creations made prior to the coming of the Spaniards. One particular map, Granata Nova, New Pomegranate. Whoa, so Granata Nova is New Pomegranate? So Granada is Pomegranate? Okay, let's see where this might be going. <laughs> Granata Nova, new pomegranate, supposedly made in the 1500s, shows features which the Spanish could not have known. It also shows one of the ancient cities as being named Abacus Unc Granata. Unc, Unc, Unc. Alright. Sounds like Unc, huh? Right. We're gonna get these cons, man. We're gonna get some on this con. Let's see how much this really, really plays, man, with this priest king. We coming right back in it. You on your ass, Preston John. This was not an Indian village. It was a city of former Roman Jewish colonies, right? This was not an Indian village. <laughs> All right. Or could, or could have been one of the seven caves of the Aztec found and inhabited by Roman Jewish colonies or the Nephites. Well, Roman Jewish colonies or the Nephites and or Nephites. So now that's one and the same inhabited by Roman Jewish colonies or and or Nephites. All right, so the only time you're, you're connecting this with indigenous people, but you say that this is not an Indian village. But it could be these Nephites, which are referring to these Hebrews. But not connecting that these Indians are these Hebrews. <laughs> or, you know, tribes, other tribes of, you know, of kin, of relation to them. That's why we connect the Roma to Romani in India. And the Jewish as Israel. So that we can clarify these connections or else you're thinking Roman uh, you know Rome Italy Italian people over here in the 700 700s in America in the 700s no these are Romani these are Roma and or Nephites my reason for bringing this up are the first are the very first names used and it is said that the city of Granada Granata or pomegranate, Spain received its name in 1100 AD. So Granada, Spain received its name in 1100 AD. Where did this place in Spain get its name? In a place having nothing to do with pomegranate. Did it derive from the days when the people of Septimania, seven, seven, sept, seven, were traveling back and forth from the new world why would they name this place the covers that covers nevada arizona utah 
and New Mexico pomegranate. So they named the four corners Granada or pomegranate. Indians and Israelites, Indians and Israelites, pomegranates, promised lands, garden of Eden. What did they know that we apparently do not? King Solomon and Moses knew. Moshe, Moab. Moab, Utah. Mount Nebo in Moab. The remains of the city of Abacus, Onk, Granada are still known, unknown. The following old maps show it to be on the north side of the Grand Canyon. Grand Con Canyon. What's this con all about? Whereas the others show it on the south side. So we're talking about the Grand Canyon, man. This is just amazing how these series are merging, man. So I would lean more towards the north side due to the frequency it appears on the north and because of the following story which i believe may be the city of tignus latin uh, place of beams or building materials located on the south side of the canyon the colorado river according to these people was called tigus rio real content con contiguous con contiguous contiguous river contiguous river Contiguous river. All right, so Granata, this is the four corners, Nova, the pomegranate. <laughs> and right here you see Cibola, Cibola, Cibola. And this is where Estevanico and the Chronicle of Acacora, that's what I'm saying, all this is merging. This is where Estevanico went in the Zuni Cibola area of what they call Hawaku. This is New Mexico. And that's where he was killed. <laughs> by the indigenous people that were there in this, you know, seven cities ago, these, this how we cool, this promised land, this promised land that Theodore Roos, you know what I'm saying, uh, re reconquered, you know what I mean, in uh, 775 AD, the same promised land that Sylvanus told Texas and, and, and Sylvanus Bravo and Ogden, all of them were already rocking in the same promised land this is what they were fighting for and then you have all the water suddenly drying up in about 1000 AD <clears throat> and then you know this exodus basically from there to you know into the Yucatan you know setting up the uh, you know the whole uh, you know uh, what's it Titi uh, Titi uh, Titi not Titi there we go I said Titi Kaka <laughs> About to Google, you know, it's like I know this one. All right, so T not T. So you got this whole thing, and that's where you're getting this Anasazi situation. And again, Anasazi is means enemies of our ancestors, right? So whoever was these enemies of their ancestors seems to be right there connected at the same point in history with this, uh, you know, Theodorus and and Solomon the Builder. You know, what I'm saying, and all them that were already rocking. In a place that was being called pomegranate or granada. All right, we're just getting started. Don't mind me. We're just getting started. So let's get some of this. This is out of a book that I'm trying to find, man. Uh, I'll get the name for it at the end of this. But uh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. I might as well. Somebody might be able to pull it up real quickly. Sticky fingers. Might be able to grab this one, man. All right, man. Uh, from Kalelus by Cyclone Covey, a Roman Jewish colony in America from the time of Charlemagne through Alfred the Great. Hey, sticky fingers. <laughs> and any of the family can get their hands on this PDF, man. So that's a couple of ones that we're looking for. And, you know, we're going to keep building that library up. Yeah, man, we're just talking about Kalelus, Kalikus, Kale, Kalikus, Kalikus. Then you got the chalice, <laughs> the chalice or cup. Ah, the cup, the cup. 
is Kalelus, is Kalix, and the seven cities of Sivola around Lake Capola. See, this is a map with all of this here. And the seven cities of Sivola, cities of gold, promised land, all this gold. Remember the Cali, California gold rush, Cali, Cali gold rush. I uh, remember Khalifa, Queen Khalifa. Khalifia, Sheba, we got the Sheba drop last time, and how that connects to the Shimbala. So this is a little excerpt out of uh, this page, you know, this book that I really, really need in my life. Saw it on Amazon for like 150 bucks or something, man, so, you know, I know, I know we can do something, man, I know we can do something. All right, so let's go. A genio, a genio. Oh, general, general, genial, responsible, responsible, a genial, responsible, 22-year-old, Iowan, so Iowa adventurer, James H. Tevis, Tevis, who had done a year's hitch in Central America with the filibuster, William Walker, took charge of the Butterfield Overland Mail Station at Apache Pass in 1858. The stone corralled station stood about halfway or six miles along the precarious road of the 5,115-foot pass in southeast Arizona. Captain Tevis made a daily barrel trip with two 10-gallon kegs to a spring about a quarter of the mile east of the station. It was on a little strip of tableland about 300 yards beyond this spring that Fort Bowie was established in 1862. The first Apache word Tevis heard happened to be the Indian's name for him, San Daisy, Mule. <laughs> These were the Karikahua, Karikahua Apaches, whose principal chief, young six foot Cochise, 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 who commanded 700 warriors, later became notorious. The second chief, Old Jack, commanded 500 warriors and 200 of them and 200 of whom went off and warred with Mexicans and the, uh, or Mexicans, Mexi, Mexicans, Mexicans, all right, just like Michigan, me, she, me, she, Okan, Michigan, me, she, me, she, so you got Meshi, Moshe, all over the place. So these Meshi, so they war with the Mexicans in Sierra Madres every winter. The third, also an aged chief in Conolia, in Conolia, commanded somewhat over 300. His brother was medicine chief of the whole Karikihua Apache tribe. With all my hatred for the Indians, said Tevis, I have no other feeling but that of affection for it. Escanolia, and never have I met a man in all my life who deserved affection for me so fully as he. All right, so why did this particular, you know, what I'm saying, you know, uh, uh, native, you know, indigenous, you know, we don't know. I mean, he's from this tribe. You know, why did he gain this affection of this dude who has such hatred for quote unquote Indians? Old Jack's young warriors wearing red headbands had just returned from Sonora in the spring of 1858 with Tevis one day described or described <clears throat> them from the top of the of a divide reinforcing a line of about 200 warriors thus giving a decided advantage against Escanolia's force drawn up opposite when the battle joined with the whoop, Tevis charged down through the red bands, fearing his six his six shooters ended up ending up amidst in Conolia's men. In Conolia gave him a good Mexican hug, saying, Usha Slok, very good. Tevis had already pleased Escanolia by giving a girl of his tribe two sacks of corn <coughs> on the bottom 
Bureau during the severe December of 1857. While the men were away on their new moon foray to Sonora, Escanolia's tribal camp lay but half a mile from the stage station. He undertook that winter to teach Tevis Apache. Now after the battle on the divide, Tevis acquired a new name, Cheese Goulet, and Gooley, Cheese Cheesy Gooley, <laughs> White Chief. All right. Cheese is white. Alright. <coughs> Alright, so after Jack, in some disgrace from not prevailing on the field, pulled his division of the tribe southeast to Laguna de Guzman in northern Chihuahua, Esconolia rarely left Tevis by day except when all campaign in Sonora determined to verse him in the Apache tradition. Thus, Tavis could record. The Apache say that at one time they were a great war tribe, but that a great army invaded their country with such terrible war implements that their people were killed before their arrows could reach the enemy. Those who did reach close enough for hand to hand fighting could not match the invaders' broad blade hatchets and broke their lances on the invaders' shields. Even though the Apaches number 20 to 1, the enemy was successful in every engagement and kept driving them north. Behind this vast army came a great number of people in charge of priests. They settled along all the watercourses, building forts and, and churches. In the mountains, they also built furnaces and melted the rocks like water. Hey. Finally, the Apaches had to succumb to the tyranny of the invaders. But these invaders were melting the rocks like water. Come on, man. And they were no better than slaves for warriors, squaws, and children worked for them. In Canolia said that about 10 days journey northwest of the Apache Pass lay an abundantly timbered valley, somewhat like a tableland many miles long and very wide with a fine stream. Here, a large city was founded. Packed trains of hundreds of animals would come and go for every every few days. This went on for years and the Apaches became more burdened and secretly they began playing their release. At last, they attacked and massacred every one of the foreigners caught outside the city, halted their farming drove their livestock away and starved the surrounding stronghold into submission in about a year. Those then still alive were easily captured, and from that time to Escanolia's narration, the Apaches had resumed sole occupancy of the former foreign empire. Escanoli did not call its capital Roda, but Montezuma City. Escanolia did not call its capital Rhoda, but Montezuma City. Tevis assumed that the invaders had entered Arizona from the Pacific coast of Mexico. The, the Pacific, not the Atlantic, the Pacific. And inquired in the vicinity of Gua, Guamas, Guaymas, Guaymas, halfway up the Gulf of California might have been the landfall. No, a great many miles farther west, as Canolia replied, through what was known at the time he was speaking as Yaqui country, Yaqui country. The Rio Yaqui is, is in fact stretches perpendicular to Guamas, east of that port and follow into Guamas Bay. Southeast, southeast of it, if Escanolia, who was not ignorant of Sonora, did not mean east, he had in mind a point near the mouth of Colorado. I told Escanolia I did not think such an account was to be found in history, and he asked me what history was and how old my country was, he laughed. 
Oh, man. Now that is the mind of an indigenous. When they say something about, I don't think such an account was to be found in history. The indigenous mind says, what is history? And how old is your country? That's what the indigenous say. Gang. <laughs> Gain and gun. <laughs> All right, let's go, let's go. So Tevis said there were churches still standing in old and New Mexico that were over 300 years old. So something must be left of the city as Canolia described, as Canolia consented to lead him to it. <laughs> They took horses a few days afterwards for about 10 days north. Late the ninth day, they camped at the foot of a large mountain near a magnificent spring, which spilled into a little valley where an old Aquiqua, Aquiqua, primitive irrigation ditch, <laughs> ran, which had once carried spring water out over the valley. If this had been Montezuma well, at Wet Beak, at Wet Beaver Creek, southeast of Cottonwood, Tevis would have mentioned that the numerous ruins still visible atop the atop the well and the cliff-type dwelling between the water and the rim of the deep Sinope, as Canolia said at the spring campsite that the mountain ahead was the last they would have to climb just over the top lay Montezuma City. It was very hard the first three hours of the early morning, Tevis said, but through a thick growth of pines, they ascended to an old trail that rose more gradually. They reached the summit about 2 p.m., overlooking a wooded tableland valley. Tableland valley. Is that like, well, like a flat, flat as a table? And if they reached the summit, are we just talking about a cut-off tree? And if we're just talking cut off tree, are we talking something like, uh, uh, let's see, Montezuma Castle, like Montezuma Castle. We're just talking tree stumps, man. <laughs> I mean, we've seen this before. I just want to get a certain perspective of it. Yeah, that's close. But let's start there. A tabletop. You keep hearing this tabletop, tabletop, tabletop. Now I've said we're just talking about a sliced off tree. And you see this castle built inside the tree. Okay, now we have perspective ride. Go get that flat drive, man. Go get with mountains of trees, man. And see, we're just talking about a severed tree. That they're calling a tabletop. Or now they call them mesas, right? All right, let's keep going. I like it. I like it. Me like you so they said in the cliff type dwellings, dwellings, cliff type dwellings, cliff type dwellings. You see all this, all these little dwellings. You see the dwellings, the cliff type dwellings. All right, perspective. Let's go. Cliff type dwellings between the water and the rim of the deep snow. Escanolia said at the spring campsite that the mountain ahead was the last they would have to climb just over the top lay Montezuma City. And here we're just talking about Montezuma Castle. They call it a national monument, ancient cliff dwelling, cliff dwelling. So this is what we're talking about, my people. Cliff type dwelling, cliff dwelling, all right. It was very hard the first three hours of the early morning, all right? Then they reached the summit at 2 p.m., overlooked the wooded Tableland Valley. Tableland, Tableland, Tableland. 
table land, like a table you eat on, flat, sliced, severed tree. I mean, can you imagine what this tree used to look like? This is only the tree stump. You see the little, you see the little, little trees at the bottom. This is a, this is a tree. We have no more trees. We have no more trees. What you see as trees are just brush, brush and bristles. <laughs> bristles and brush. They're just the brush. They're just the damn near the moss <laughs> compared to these giant trees that reach the firmament. Slides down. Crystal roots, crystals, crystals. And they're living in trees. Here in the four corners. Montezuma City, man. Looking a wooded tableland valley with the fair stream running through it, just as Escanolia had described. And there, just a short distance into the valley, lay Montezuma City. After we had ridden about a mile, we began to pass a great number of mounds of various sizes mounds, pyramids. Mounds, pyramid, which lasted until we reached the stream where we camped. Large herds of elk and deer could be seen on either side and wild turkeys everywhere. The stream was filled with mountain trout. Here we spent two days riding over the valley examining the mounds, pyramids, mounds. Whenever they find pyramids here, they call them mounds. So that's a lot of times key words for some form of you know pyramid action you know once in a while it's just some more like a small dirt mound type of thing but you know don't just think a dirt mound their mounds many times are pyramids which extended for miles on both sides of the stream the courses of the aqui quias aci quias quias were quite discernible as cannolia took me to a very large mound pyramid mound where he said the commander had lived <laughs> he lived in a large pyramid mound and as we went across the old crumbled walls we found old pottery and copper implements and some articles which resembled helmets and breastplates while i was examining these things old escanolia watched me very intently and said ton uga what is the name of it I explained to him why their arrows and lances had no effect upon the invaders of the country. I told him that it was a metal covering which even the balls of a rifle could not penetrate, much less arrow. In, in, inside these ruins were signs everywhere of a once populous city. Populous city with breastplate armor. It was certainly one of the loveliest valleys I've ever seen. Tevis asked Escanolia why his tribe did not live there, live here. Aghast, he said, this was sacred ground, which the great spirit forbade their living on. So whatever tribe he's coming with, you know what I'm saying? Whatever the name for it was. The Most High, the Great Spirit, forbade his tribe to live on this particular ground that Montezuma City is in. We're talking about the Four Corners. We're talking about Arizona. We're talking about, you know, specific frequencies and areas, specific lots, birthright land. When you're indigenous, your genes is connected. It's, it's a gene thing. It's an energy thing. Let's go, let's go. Man, dig on that library, let's go. <laughs> so look, so he was forbade, the great spirit forbade their living there. Escanolia stated that the stream running through Montezuma City flowed into two Inza, Itza, large waters, i.e. the Colorado, by which Tevis judged the valley lay east of the Colorado through a large low place atop a mountain range extending about eight to ten miles wide east and west as far as the eye could see as Canolia said one would find a mountain as large as the one the two had just come up tevis estimated from the distance they had traveled that it was that it would stand between the three and four hundred miles northwest 
of what is today the town of Bowie, just above the north entrance to Apache Pass, San Francisco Peak above Flagstaff, while gazing north as Canolia went on to describe the Grand Canyon. Ah oh, man, I mean, this is only part five of Indians and Israelites. In this Grand Canyon of Arizona, and American Hebrew artifacts, American Hebrew artifacts. So Escanolia went on to describe the Grand Canyon. Now listen up. Which he called Terus Tu Shu Shodu Shodo. Bad Mountains. He called them the Bad Mountains. Now remember, the Great Spirit forbid him to live there. So if he's calling them the Bad Mountains, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, you know let me be clear. The Great Spirit forbid him to live where exactly? Let's go back. The Great Spirit forbade their living all. All right, so. Okay, so I believe right here we're just talking specifically this Montezuma City or this area. And I think he's talking about the Grand Canyon separately, calling the Grand Canyon Bad Mountains. But, you know, still it's coming from a tribe of people who were forbade by the Creator to live there. So, you know, it could be straight up hijack. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to say. But the walls were perpendicular on either side of the river, which had cut its way through the bad mountains. He said he had frequently heard his people say that the invaders had an underground passage through the Grand Canyon, but that he had never found it. So... He's talking about these invaders, right? Now, if this is from the perspective, we're just surfing the way of the, let's say the Anasazi being called enemies of our ancestors. And let's say his particular tribe will call the Anasazi their enemies of their ancestors or say they're invading them, similar to how they say Joshua is invading them, but he's taking back his lot. He's clearing his lot, which is your lot. Call him Kitsikoltu, call him Huey Mock, Moshe. All these connections that we're building, all these parallels that we're building. Um, you know what I mean? So, you know, if we're looking at someone who's forbid, for, forbidden by the Creator to live in this area, so he's coming from an outside, I can't live there when someone else can live there. All right. So these people that do live there, you could be calling the Anasazi or the, the enemies or the invaders. And he could be talking about you. He could be talking about Joshua and the crew. As the invaders had an underground passage through the Grand Canyon. But that he had never found it. He and Tevis took the same tra trail back except for not turning off at the thicket of pines on their left they could see that they took to be old shafts made by the jesuits <laughs> and a few miles farther on the remains of the old reduction works each day they kept passing old abandoned shafts the last one between san francisco and gila rivers about 12 miles from their confluence the 700 mile or so round trip took place apparently in the summer or fall of 1858. All right, man. All right. So, you know, you dig on that. I want to keep going. But that's from the Kalelus, from Kalelus by Cyclone Covey, Roman Jewish colony or Romani Israelite colony in America during the time of Charlemagne. Remember this map? We're just talking granata, the pomegranate. Lelu, 